The reading today is from Colossians 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, just evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is renewed in knowledge, in the image of its creator. Thank you. Right. We, um, we are in part nine of our series in Colossal, which is the book of Colossians. Now to live the life. Are my glasses wonky? No. There's something wrong with them. Scott pointed it out to me. Are they level? I don't wish to be a distraction other than as I usually am. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Now to live the life. Last week, in our previous chapter, we were reminded to take no notice of teaching that may sound Christian, but underneath it's a dangerous ideology or a philosophy. We're also told to beware those who come with a fake humility, but actually I just want to draw you away from Christ and the people of Christ, and the things of Christ. We also talked about sussing out the pseudo-spiritual, those who are fakely, overly spiritual about everything, but they're always chasing, like the Gnostics, uh, always chasing after the latest movement or spiritual high. Be discerning. Not everyone who comes in the name of Jesus is of Jesus. And some of us have been casualties to that in the past. The other thing we said was don't give ear to legalists. Those are the people who try to burden you down with add-ons from which Christ has already set you free. And if you don't comply, these legalists often bully, intimidate, manipulate, control, judge and condemn. Ultimately, you can't control others. You can't change others. Leave the change to the Lord. Control yourself Let the Lord change you. And if you do speak the truth, come alongside in love before you rebuke and teach and encourage. But in the end, leave the results to the Lord. It's not up to us then to hammer it home. It does more um, more hammering, more damage than good. But this week now, we're looking at how to live this new life that we talked about last week in Jesus. And it's called living out of the new nature. We have an old nature, what we once were, and we have a new nature created to be like God that God has implanted within us. And how do we live out the uh, new nature? By setting our minds on things above, verses 1 to 4. Why do we need to set our minds now on things above, heavenly things? First reason is because you're risen, past tense, you are risen with Christ if you're a believer. Verse 1 says, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. When you came to Jesus in repentance and faith and trusted him as Lord, you joined what Stott calls the divine society. I love that. It's an amazing, amazing phrase. Let me explain. The first four words in the Bible are, in the beginning, God. In other words, straight away, 
we're told that God existed before anything else he created. And at one point, when you wheel back into eternity past, nothing existed except the three in one, what we call the divine society, which is made up of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they were envelop- are enveloped in a union so close, though they were three, they were also one. Compact giving love, receiving love, back and forth to one another through all eternity, totally synced in thought and word and deed. And the other thing about God was he was 100% satisfied and happy in himself. He didn't need anyone else. He wasn't dependent on anyone else. He was utterly self-sustaining, self-existing, and self-sufficient, which is not true of you, and it's not true of me. He was perfect in love, and truth, and justice, and power, and holiness, and anything else you can think of that's good. It wasn't that he was bored that he created us. It wasn't that he needed to create us. But his very nature is love, and love gives. Love lavishes. And he wanted to lavish his love onto his creation. So he created angels, and then he created you and me. And everything was going great, as we know. Then sin came, ruined it all, and separated us from that wonderful, seamless relationship from our Maker. And as they say, the rest is history. Except God is so love that he wouldn't leave it like that. Though it was our fault, he would not leave us to our own devices. And what a blessed thing it is when you get saved, when you're no longer left to your own devices. Because we all have a self-destruct button, and that's what we do when we live without the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God the Son, one of those blessed three, enters our world and becomes human like us, 100% human, 100% God, and he becomes a baby, and then a toddler, and then a teen, and then an adult. And then he lays down his life, human for humans. And he takes the death penalty for your sin and for mine upon himself, so now all who come to him in the world who acknowledge their sin, which severed us in the first place, turn from their sin and trust him as Lord, as king of their life, also becomes one with God as they are one. The divine society, Father, Son and Spirit, chose in eternity past to let you and me enter in. That in itself is a phenomenal privilege but you see the incredible thing is at the moment you trust Christ you become one with God and that in itself if you continue to meditate and chew that over will blow your mind Jesus in his what they call his high priestly prayer to his father says this to his father John 17 22 he's talking about us I have given them The glory that you, Father, gave me. What's the glory? That they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. In other words, Jesus makes oneness with God possible. He's the meeting place between God God and man and bridges the gap because God is in him and God is in us and that's where we meet the Father and see the Father and become one with him. And then he says... May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and you, Father, have loved them, this is ridiculous, have loved them even as you have loved me. What on earth is that? When you're one with God, we then seek to be one with one another, which is also Jesus' prayer. Why am I talking about oneness? Because our passage begins like this. 
that now you are raised with Christ. You're one with Christ. So he died, you died. He rose, you were raised. You cannot even get a piece of paper, this kind of paper, which is very cheap print copy, and not even printer paper, copy paper. You can't get that between you and God. It's impossible to slot anything between you and Christ. Now the old you is dead. And you are raised to the new you, which brings new life. And you're one with Christ, no longer one with your old lifestyle, because you're one with Christ. No longer one with your self-centered interests, because you're one with Christ. No longer interested in the earthly things that weren't of God, because they're no longer relevant or appropriate for your new risen life that you now lead. So there is no more living out of the old nature. We must now live out of the new and live the risen life we've been given. How do you do that? By focusing on the things, not of earth anymore, but the things above, the things of the risen life. One, set, verse 1, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated, risen, at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. You see, what also happens is you change citizenship. You're no longer a citizen of this world and its philosophies and the tide that, it's, uh, that everybody is swimming along to. You are now a citizen of heaven, of things above. So what Paul is saying, he says, if you're a citizen now of heaven and this dramatic change has happened, this heart transplant, this nature transplant has happened, then live like a citizen of heaven by desiring things of heaven and desiring the Christ of heaven. Do you desire the Christ of heaven? Or are you fiddling about still with the earthly things? So the risen people are to focus on where Jesus is now. After his supreme sacrifice, he is now high and lifted up, never to be sacrificed again. That's why I hate crucifixes. There's no body on the tomb. You wear a cross, for goodness sake. Don't wear one with a body on. <laughs> He's not there. He's high and lifted up. This is where he is, at the right hand of the throne on high. And after his supreme sacrifice... He's now sitting on the seat of supreme power next to God, the God of supreme power, supremely ruling and reigning over all things. He is supreme. And the other thing that blows me a bit, it blows my mind, is Christ not only is at the right hand of the Father, we read in Isaiah that he's the Father's right arm, the absolute show of strength the one who makes things happen that the Father wills. Isaiah 59, 16. God saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to in intervene. So his own arm worked salvation for him. And his own righteousness sustained him. Look to Jesus Fix on Jesus, feed on Jesus and the things of Jesus. And you will find that if you're so focused, and it's easy to lose that focus, but if you're so focused, you press deeper and deeper into him and in the things of heaven. And as you do so, the things of earth begin to drop off a little and they begin to fade. And you actually begin to see them for what they really are. You begin to see them how God sees them. And then you're not bothered about them. And as you fix on Jesus, you become enamoured by him, taken up by him, captivated by him, drawn by him. And when you do that, you don't realise, because it's almost automatic, but when you do that, you think, wow, I'm not thinking about myself anymore. <laughs> whoop, whoop. I'm not thinking about others in a bad way anymore. I'm not even thinking about the power of the enemy and what he's trying to do. And I'm definitely not thinking about this ridiculous world and its philosophies because I'm staring right into the face of, by faith of Jesus. And you see, as you fix on him, you desire him even more. 
and you want to live for him. And desire without doing, without living out, is a pointless desire. People say, fulfill your dreams. Well, they need to be God's dreams, first of all. And when they are God dreams, don't let them remain dreams. Just live it out. Otherwise, it means absolutely no. And as you fix on him, and you desire him, and you live for him, you are empowered by him. And when you start doing this, you begin to see the wonder of being one with him. Because it's all fine to have it in your head, but it starts to work out when the rubber hits the road. And you just think, this is incredible. And the same time, you're not aware of it either, is that when you fix on Jesus and the things of Jesus, the Holy Spirit within you is getting you ready for the day when you'll eventually see him face to face. Until then, he is changing you into his likeness right now as you hear, if you obey. That's the way he does it. So as you look at Christ, you're not aware you're being changed. But as you're looking, you're being changed. And it, that's probably the best way. You're being changed into his likeness. It's like an old married couple, isn't it? And they're finishing off each other's sentences. Now, sometimes that can be annoying. But other times, they actually do seem to know <laughs> what the other person was going to say. You took the words right out of my mouth. Must have been when I was kissing you. Anybody? Who is it? Who is it? Meatloaf. Meatloaf. Um, but you're like an old married couple. And also, you get to know what they're thinking. I mean, it's, it, can, it can get you in trouble, guys, but... You, can, you get to know what they're thinking, or at least you think they know what they're thinking, and you almost predict what their actions are, but you do get it wrong, and then that's where it all goes pear-shaped. But you're increasingly, as you live closely with one up, getting to know what it is to be one, to know what it looks like. In fact, to Julie's horror, you begin to look like each other. <laughs> that might be your biggest regret. How much, how much more with Christ? You've been raised with Christ. You live and you love the risen things. And you love the risen life. I've been listening to this Jesus culture song. My soul longs for you. Nothing else will do. And it repeats like Jesus culture does. It loops and loops and loops. But the good thing is, it gets into your head. So then you're walking around saying, my soul longs for you, nothing else will do. That's setting your mind and your desires upon things above. And because we're risen, we must now learn to stay far away from the grave and the things of death. Because now you have risen robes on. You're wearing life clothes. So why would you ever go back and put on, at, at the end of our uh, passage it says, put off the old self and put on the new. It's like a clothing thing. Why would you ever go back and put on the grave clothes again? They're actually not yours anymore. They don't fit anymore. They don't suit you anymore. And they will kill you. This whole idea of looking to Jesus comes in with that great song, doesn't it? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. So it's wherever you, you look in the light of his glory and grace. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you. We behold you. Our Savior ever true, our Jesus we turn our eyes to you. That's what happens when you turn your eyes to Jesus and keep them there. Set your mind on things above. Why? Because you're risen with Christ. You have a new life to live. The second reason to set your mind on things above is we're now dead to the world dead to sin and dead to the things of sin. Verse 3, for you died. Because of our oneness and union with him that we mentioned earlier, when Christ dies phys died physically, we died spiritually to the influences of this world and sin and the things of sin. That's what Paul actually means. 
When Christ lay physically dead in that tomb, the things of the earth, the world, sin, and the things of sin had no influence over him. You know why? Because a dead body cannot be influenced or even aware of anything that goes on in this world. Now, we are aware of what's going on in this world, but what Paul's saying is that just as Christ's dead body couldn't be influenced by the things of the earth, that's the unhelpful things of the world, you and I must approach such things as if we're physically dead to them, as if we're dead to them. And this is very, very hard when they're coming at us left, right and centre, through the box in the corner, through the internet, through our phones, you name it. But the cross has given the earthly or the sinful nature a death blow, a fatal wound, and the old you is stone cold dead. But you know what happens? We visit his grave, her grave, and we try and say, come on then, raise, raise yourself a little. I'm in the mood. Let it sleep in death. Let them rest in peace. Well, we don't want the sinful nature to rest in peace, but just cut it out. Just, <laughs> just kill it, the Bible says. We're getting there in a minute. You see, though you are now dead spiritually to earthly things, you are alive to heavenly things. So set your mind on things above. In other words, recognize what Christ has done and what you are in union with him. And then the third reason why we set our mind, thing on minds, minds on things above is that your eternal risen life could not be more secure. And this is probably one of the best, the last point's the best one, but this is a great one. Verse 3, for you died, old you, and your life, new life, is now hidden with Christ in God. And what this means is it's like a hidden treasure that has been hidden away in a secure place. What treasure? Your new risen life. Now, this needs to blast out all cobwebs of doubt for you who doubt. Let me tell you why. Your life in Christ, is what Paul is saying, is couldn't be safer because it's hidden with Christ in God. In other words, that treasure, your new life, isn't left with us for our safekeeping. Hallelujah for that. Praise God for that. You know why? Because it could be lost, or it could be stolen, or we could be scammed out of it. But that's impossible. Why? Because your future life in glory is secure in heaven's safe. In heaven's vault. It's out of sight of all enemies. It's untouchable for them. It's unreachable. You know when you have kids and you put something out of their reach because it's not going to do them any good. And uh, I don't know what it is. Maybe they've had too many biscuits or maybe it's just, I don't know, maybe it's matches. I don't know. So you put them out and they say, Dad, Dad, can you get it down? Can you? No, I won't. <laughs> it's unreachable. God is not going to get you down and give you, yes, you have responsibility, but ultimately he keeps you. Yes, you have to cooperate. But he's not going to, uh, what he's locked up as a hidden treasure for you, your risen life, give it to you to mess about with. It's unreachable. It's impenetrable. It's incorruptible. We see that at other places. And the best thing is it's guarded by the Father and the Son. It's hidden with Christ in God. Jesus says the same in John 10, 28. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. That's his hand. And now look, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. That He is explaining this verse hidden with Christ in God. What an amazing fact that is. Does that not give you rock-solid security? Does that not stop you looking at your performance, good or bad, and help you lean on the fact that God is keeping you? And it's all locked up safe and secure. The Holy Spirit comes as a guarantee for what is to come. Now please let me drill that into your mind until there is no doubt left whatsoever. And if I can't do it, well, I can't do it. As I said, you can't force anybody to believe. Just keep looking over this. Look over it. Look at it until it gets into your mind and into your head and into your heart. One of the best lines in an old hymn is this. More happy, but not more secure, the glorified spirits in heaven. 
those who have gone before. They are more happy. They are not more secure. Uh, well, you know, why don't we just stop there and bask in it all day and go, whoop, whoop, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And perhaps then in the second session of music, we'll be going. Well, I know we were going for it, but let's vocally go for it. Let's pray, let's praise, let's shout out loud because this is worth raising the rooftops for, isn't it? Amen. Yeah. yeah, so come on afterwards, come on. Just get rid of your downness. Do, tell do a David and said, why are you down? Comes so what? I will praise the Lord. This is no vain hope what we have. It's a rock-solid security. Again an old hymn. A man there is, a real man, with wounds still gaping wide, from which rich streams of blood once ran, in hands and feet and side. Tis no wild fancy of our brains, no metaphor we speak. The same dear man in heaven now reigns that suffered for our sake. What a reason to kill the old life and live the risen life. What a reason to set your mind on things above. And here's our final reason why we should set our mind on things above. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When will Christ appear? When he returns to take his people to himself, to snatch them up in the air, to resurrect the dead, to judge the living and the dead, to create the new heavens and the new earth, where his people, and if you're one of them, you will live with him at the center physically of this earth, this new earth, you will live with him forever. Now, that is supposed to be in the Bible the supreme motivator for every single follower of Jesus. The thing that puts a spring back in your step. The reason you get up in the morning. The very one thing that keeps you going. Because one glorious day, sin will be no more. And Satan and all those outside of Christ will be thrown into the lake of fire. Another old hymn puts it brilliantly. Sin, my worst enemy before, shall vex my eyes and ears. No more. My inward foes shall all be slain. Nor Satan break my peace again. What a line. You know, I think my worst enemy is myself. That's why you've got to kill him and live out of the new self. You've got to. Because you'll do yourself in otherwise. And sickness and sadness and sorrow will one day be gone. The hymn writer says this, Then shall I see and hear and know all I desired or wished below, as I was looking at Jesus, and every faculty find sweet employ or full satisfaction in that eternal world of joy the other great thing about glory is this that dying and death will be eliminated death is crushed to death life is mine to live worm through your selfless love Jesus but you know that's not Sometimes we live because of the benefits of heaven and we can't wait to go there for the benefits. And yes, <laughs> that's part of it. That's understandable. But there's something much better. And supposing you've just got there or you've just set foot on the new heavens and the new earth. Everything is complete. You're complete. And Christ, Christ is... Well, no. I know you spot it then. And then you're in there and you're just amazed that you're not sick anymore. And you're amazed that you're not anxious anymore. And you're amazed that 
there's no temptation or desire or anything going through your head that's not right, and you're amazed that the devil isn't there or never will be again, and you're just so knocked out by all of it, you can't get your hat on. And then suddenly, your eyes move from the glory of the kingdom to the glory of the king. And you see, if he's the one that you've been looking to and making yourself look to and fix your eyes on down here, imagine when faith gives way to sight and the veil is lifted, what that will be like when you are staring into the face of life and love and grace. I think we underestimate that part. But the land is all the... I haven't written this hymn down, so forget it. Oh, the Lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. And you know, this was the thought, the only thought, the only thing that kept Job going. And it, sh it is designed to be the only thing that keeps us going. Job 19.25 I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth and remember, Job thought he was going to die. And after my skin has been destroyed in death, yet in my flesh will I see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. Ah, it's such an emphasis. It's personal. It's all he cares about. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. Is that you here this morning? Would you rather go there than see your son or daughter married? Would you rather go there than live to a ripe old age and uh, not that there's anything wrong with that? In other words, what is it that captivates you? Is it stuff down here or is it him and looking to see him? Because that's the motivator. That will get you through the worst of persecution. That will get you through beheadings. That will get you through whippings. That will give you through doubts. That will get you through anything the enemy throws at you is that rock-solid hope that's hidden with Christ in God. And all through his suffering, what was it that stopped Job giving up and cursing God and dropping out of the race? It was the rock-solid certainty of Christ's return and being forever in his physical presence and the glory of seeing him face to face. Why? Because while Job was down here, that's the only place he looked. And when you look to Jesus, you become like Jesus. And you imagine when you look at him physically, that first look finishes off the job of sanctification once and for all. Because when Christ who is your life appears, then also you will appear with him in glory, just like him. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will, we will be changed. Why set your mind on things above? Because soon and very soon you're going to see the king. So now, right now, we need to live the life. And in the last bit of our passage, and this is very quick now, because you're risen, Paul says, kill everything that rises up and belongs to your earthly or sinful nature. Be ruthless with your old self. Put to death, verse 5, Therefore, because of all those truths we've just heard, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity. He's making it specific. Lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. He's saying don't give any of these things any attention anymore, any life anymore, that they militate against you. Don't let the parts of your body be used for these sins anymore. You did all that. Goodness sake, don't do it now. You don't need to anymore. 
He's saying, kill all illicit sexual intercourse outside of marriage. Kill all illicit sexual intercourse outside of marriage. Sexual immorality is the word pornea, where we get pornography. It means actually all illicit intercourse. God set marriage to be the context for sexual intercourse right at the beginning. All of the contexts, therefore, he calls illicit, sinful. Note the order right at the beginning, the pattern for all creation. Before the fall, before sin had come, God is the father of the bride. He created her. She's got no dad except God. God's the father of the bride, and he brings her to the man, Genesis 2.22. Then the Lord God brought her to the men. Words were exchanged. This is where we got our wedding service from. Words were exchanged in the presence of God. Verse 22, the man said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. Then we're given the reason why marriage was given. This is all pre-fall. And Jesus backs it up. And the New Testament backs it up. This isn't an obscure doctrine. Verse 24 of Genesis 2. For this reason... A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. But see, first they're united by God in his presence and vows are exchanged and in his presence. Then the sex. And they will become one flesh. See, that comes after. They're united by God in his presence. Then they become one flesh. And then we read in the end. So there was the order, divine order, right from the beginning. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Why? Because the union had been sanctioned and blessed by God and sex was then given in God's context of marriage. That's why they were so happy and they felt no shame. That was and that is the pattern God ordained at the beginning. And let me tell you, nothing's changed except society. And Paul says, put to death Give no life to sex outside of marriage. Then he says, kill impurity, verse 5. That means anything that defiles you. You've had that before. Even watching certain stuff on telly and you just feel soiled, defiled. And you just think, I hate this feeling. Why did I watch that? Why did I say that? Why did I hear that? Why did I choose to put myself... Sometimes you can't choose it, but why did I, out of my own choice, choose to put myself in that environment? I'm dirty now. Anything that defiles, kill it. Lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. You see, basically, here's the bottom line if you take nothing else away today. It's about focus. The Christian life is always about where you look. It's a focus on things above on risen things and heavenly things that give and sustain risen life. Or you focus on earthly things that bring death and pull you away from Christ and make you live for other things, which is idolatry. In other words, just like in the old days when I became a Christian, which the edges are blurred now, aren't they? But then I was always told, and it was a right principle, there has to be an ongoing and definitive split with the old life and an embracing of the new, no half-heartedness, literally a killing of, and, and a continual killing of the old life and embracing the new. And anything that takes away Christ's number one position is idolatry. And then this, you and I, if we trust Christ, we're no longer under God's wrath. Isn't that amazing? So why would we live like those who are. Verse 6, because of these things that he's just listed, the wrath of God is coming. So why do we, I don't know, I do it, you do it, why do we? It's not worthy of us anymore. And then lastly, you know when people say the, most thing, the, the best thing you can do is to be yourself. Well, that depends what self you're talking about. <laughs> Or be true to yourself. Well, that also depends what self you... If I'm true to my old self, I'll tell you what, <laughs> you wouldn't want to know me. But the Bible says, be true to your new self. The real you. Not the dead old you. The real you. If you want to 
I hate that word self-actualization, it's not about self, but if you want a Christ-actualization, <laughs> if, you, if you want to really be who you were created to be, live out of the new self, which is the real you that Christ has given you. Verse 7, you used to walk, see there's a dividing line, you used to walk in these ways, the ones he's listed, in the life you once lived. He assumes you don't do that anymore. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off, there's the clothing thing, your old self, with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Let me encourage you if you're a believer, now, even if you're being convicted right now, and if you are, please come for prayer. We'll work it through, no judgments. But look, you are not what you once were. You're not the one that you used to be. You are different from that. You're not that old person anymore. Or you certainly don't need to be. Set your mind on things above where Christ is seated seated at the right hand of the Father. Why? Because you're risen. Why? Because you're dead to the world, the sin and the things of sin. Why? Because your eternal future is absolutely secure. It's not a gamble. And why? Because soon and very soon you're going to see the King. Amen. Let's just pray as Scott comes up. Uh, Normally he's up by now because he's had enough and he starts tuning up. But... (laughs) But, uh, Let's just pray as they're they're getting ready. Father, we just thank you for your word. Sometimes it cuts like a knife. Sometimes it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You come in conviction, Lord. But the devil comes in accusation. We pray that we would uh, black out the accusations of the enemy saying, useless, you can't possibly keep it this Christian life. What's the point? You've just been told what the point is by God. Help us to listen, Lord. Help us to hang on to these things. Help us to be convicted in order that we can live that risen life, that abundant life, that full life that you have promised us. Help us to, uh, to be sheep that listen to your voice and uh, know when a stranger's talking and know when you're talking. Help us to follow you. Help us to rid ourselves of all this stuff that belongs to the earth and fix our eyes on you. Amen.